Governors, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to call to order the 2022 annual meetings of the Boards of Governors of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank Group. I welcome all governors representing all member countries. On behalf of all participants, I would like to extend through the Governor of the United States our deep appreciation to the people of the United States for the warm welcome and gracious hospitality. It is customary in these meetings for the Chair to address the Governors, and I shall proceed this way. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 2022 Plenary of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank Group. I am pleased that we are meeting in person today, which is a testament to the extraordinary collective will that allowed us to combat a global pandemic. Since we last met, the global economy has been hit by multiple shocks. The implications of the war in Ukraine and the lingering pandemic weigh heavily on the global economic outlook, affect livelihoods, and create trade-offs for policy makers. Inflation is at multi-decade highs with rising food and energy insecurity, supply chain disruptions, and debt vulnerabilities. Financial conditions are tightening, while capital flow and exchange rate volatility have increased dramatically. My concern is mostly about low- and middle-income countries that face all these challenges. They also face formidable development challenges with insufficient financing and limited access to markets. Many of these countries are in the Middle East and Africa in which Egypt is rooted given its critical geographic location. In addition to the essential financing, policy advice, and capacity development provided in the past two years, the IMF and the World Bank Group have a central role to play in supporting the membership at this critical juncture. I would like to focus on a few of these priorities. In their policy advice, the Bretton Woods institutions need to guide countries' policy responses while continuing to be mindful of social and political economy considerations. This applies to fiscal responses to high food and energy prices and to the complicated trade-offs facing monetary policy. More must be done to address rising debt vulnerabilities that affect an increasing proportion of emerging market and developing countries. The IMF needs to continue working with partners to tackle current and future debt challenges. The World Bank Group must help prevent the reversal of hard-won development gains, particularly in the poorest countries. In their financial support to members, the Bretton Woods institutions need to be agile and generous. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the IMF and the World Bank acted rapidly, including through the 650 billion SDR allocation and significantly expanded financing. They should continue providing this support, including vulnerable middle-income countries. In order to support the global economy, these institutions need to be adequately resourced themselves. In this connection, I look forward to a successful conclusion of the IMF's 16th review of quotas. We must also not lose sight of longer-term challenges, notably job creation, more equal opportunities, economic diversification, climate change, and digitalization. Rising inequality and fragility heighten the need for action. By 2030, climate change alone could push up to 132 million people into extreme poverty. We must act collectively with a deep commitment to global cooperation. World Bank Group lending for climate-related investment reached nearly $32 billion the last fiscal year, and support for climate change adaptation is significantly increasing. 
the World Bank Group's $170 crisis response package supports global public goods which benefits all countries. To help members build resilience against climate change and future pandemics, the IMF rolled out Resilience and Sustainability Facility. We look forward to an expansion in the scope of this facility in due time to include more structural changes. The IMF also approved a new full shock financing window for countries most in need. However, more efforts are needed to ensure pledges to the Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust, as well as the Resilience and Sustainability Trust, meet the global ambition to voluntarily channel 100 billion of unused SDRs. Once financing for these trusts is ensured, consideration could be given to channeling part of the SDR reserves through multilateral development banks. Egypt is fulfilling its role on climate change and is proud to be hosting the 2022 United Nations Climate Change COP27 in November in Sharm el-Sheikh, where we welcome you all. <laughs> COP27 will focus on financing for adaptation, including compensation for economic losses and damages due to climate catastrophes. International financial institutions, in particular multilateral development banks, have a significant role to play in supporting low emissions and a just transition to climate resilience. They should facilitate access and increase allocations of climate finance and expand their concessional instrument and risk appetite climate. Colleagues, we have a saying in my country, and I'm sure they're similar in most countries, Awal Shagar Abizra which means the tree begins with a seed. It is difficult. In this difficult global environment, let us together plant a seed for our shared future. We owe it to our people whom we ultimately seek to serve. This year, the theme for the annual meetings is, is guided by some of the complex changes facing the membership. As we tackle these changes, I urge you to actively listen to the debates generously share your ideas and experiences, and brainstorm with your colleagues from across the globe to arrive at impactful solutions. The broad-based membership of, of the IMF and the World Bank Group and the timeless framework of multilateral cooperation provide us with the opportunity to put the global economy back on sound footing and achieve our shared goals of prosperity and inclusive growth everywhere Thank you. At this time, I would like to call on the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, Ms. Georgieva, to address the Governors. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair, uh, for your remarks. Uh, like many of us, I'm looking forward to COP27 in Egypt. Uh, I'm so happy to see so many of us again together, colleagues and friends, first time in person in three years. I stand in front of you on behalf of the dedicated and hardworking staff of the IMF. And I want to recognize them for their service to our members. I want to thank our senior management team, Gita Gopina, Antoinette Sayer, Bo Lee, Kenji Okamura, and all who over the last years have worked to make sure that we are, he, we are always there for you, for our members. One of our founding fathers, John Maynard Keynes, wrote that the best economists study the present in light of the past 
for the purpose of the future, and it is fitting to apply this framework in our circumstances today, starting from the light of the recent past. Since we gathered in person, the world has seen extraordinary uphill, pandemic, war, and record high inflation driving a cost of living crisis. For policymakers, the pandemic meant taking extraordinary action to shield households and firms from the worst impacts. This was vital, but in the process, additional spending reached 10% of GDP globally in the first 18 months of the pandemic. As crisis has followed crisis, many countries faced sharply reduced buffers and increased external pressures. And the IMF stepped up to help, in fact, with an unprecedented response 260 billion in new financing to 93 economies delivered with record speed just since COVID-19 hit. And after the invasion of, of Russia in Ukraine, we have supported 16 countries with close to 90 billion and a further 28 countries have expressed interest in receiving fund support. And that comes on top of the uh, record $650 billion SDR allocation last year. Even as countries tackled immediate and pressing challenges, vulnerabilities have been building up. Supply demand imbalances, pandemic era policy support, and Russia's war in Ukraine have all driven inflationary pressures. Sovereign debt reached record high in 2020, and now it is projected at 91% of GDP globally this year, while accommodative monetary policy pushed up prices for riskier assets. What we are experiencing is a fundamental shift from a period of relative stability, low rates, low inflation, to a period of high rates, high inflation, much greater uncertainty. And this comes as climate disasters became far more frequent and more extreme, and geopolitical tensions make global cooperation far harder. We are entering a new dangerous zone, a world that is more fragmented, more fragile, and more prone to shocks that can quickly knock countries off course, often though of no fault of their own. After navigating extraordinary challenges over the past two and a half years, further Similarly, difficult challenges lie ahead. The path is likely to be just as tough, if not tougher. Turning to the present, the IMF's projection for global growth next year is 2.7%, the fourth downgrade in 12 months, and there is one in four chance it could fall below 2%. Markets have been extremely volatile and the risk of recession is rising in many economies. The biggest immediate challenge is to bring inflation down. And we see central banks rapidly tightening policy, laser focused on restoring price stability. It is the right thing to do, 
for growth and also to shield people, especially the poorest. But it will come at a painful cost. Growth will be slower and unemployment higher as monetary tightening ratchets up. Formulating the right fiscal policy is key. The priority must be to protect vulnerable households with targeted measures to alleviate the impact of rising food and fuel prices. And at the same time, fiscal policy must work with, not against, monetary policy. To avoid stocking inflation, any new spending must be offset by saving or by new revenues. And the need to rebuild buffers and reduce debt makes this doubly important. The pandemic gave us a very vivid illustration of why fiscal space matters and how critical it is to address pre-existing vulnerabilities. Uh, like people with strong immune systems, economies with strong fundamentals withstand shocks much better. As policymakers determine the right balance of monetary and fiscal measures, they must also keep a watchful eye on stresses in the financial sector. And here, macroprudential policy must guard against the failure of systemic institutions using selected instruments to address pockets of elevated vulnerability among non-bank financial institutions and credit markets. Policymakers have an incredibly narrow path to walk. There is no room for missteps. Get it wrong, and the challenges of the present could mutate into worse problems, prolonged low growth, entrenched inflation, or even sovereign debt crisis with risk of contagion. On the other hand, a well-calibrated policy package would, over time, lead to more durable growth, more stable prices, and healthier public finances. More than that, we will see more resilient economies emerge, better prepared to cope with shocks. As we look to the future, the right choices we make today can avoid, avoid the worst outcomes, but actually also pave a better projection for what is to come. They begin with a more proactive, precautionary mindset to build resilience in a more shock-prone world. And there are three pillars to it. Resilient economies, resilient people, resilient planet. First, resilient economies. Uh, even as risks rise, we must strengthen fundamentals and start with credible medium-term fiscal framework. Why? Because grounding fiscal policy in a solid set of rules helps ensure a more predictable outlook and foster macroeconomic stability. And more importantly, credible frameworks build investor trust, which helps governments maintain vital spending plans and stabilize their debts without the pain of sharp austerity. Some countries are already confronting severe debt problems more than 60% of low-income countries and over 25% of emerging markets are at the, the, uh, that distress or near it. And this would only get worse if interest rates rise further, the dollar gets stronger and capital outflows increase. An effective debt resolution mechanism is desperately uh, needed. In particular, something that David Malpass and I have been advocating for, a common framework that is expanded with clarity and all creditors, both sovereign and private, taking their fair share of responsibility. The alternative is the risk of disorderly debt crisis, which would harm everyone involved. And of course, we know prevention 
much better than cure. Better debt transparency and governance will help avoid situations of distress, so will a system to identify risks early. And on both fronts, we are actively advancing efforts to support our members. And in this way, we are applying a more proactive approach. During the pandemic, we saw our precautionary lending reach 141 billion, clear example of how early access to fund support can help maintain liquidity and smooth adjustments. And on the eve of these uh, meetings, we agreed a new food shock window to provide additional IMF financing to those countries hit hardest by the global food crisis. Going further, last year, SDR allocation helped shore up reserves across the whole membership, and the rechanneling of these SDRs continues. This is what we need to do, be proactive. Um, measures I described are vital, but they are not enough. We must do more, and that brings me to resilience of people. The, the pandemic accelerated the shift to the digital and knowledge economy that is driving productivity and prosperity in the 21st century. Investing in all aspects of human capital is a priority for all our members, from health, education, social safety nets, to reforms that boost equity and access to technology. And again, a key challenge for policy maker, makers, again, the IMF is stepping up. I want to recognize my predecessor, Christine Lagarde. She advanced uh, our work on putting a floor on social spendings, uh, and I'm stepping into, into her uh, 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 path, that, the path that she uh, put in front of us. We are advancing new strategies related to gender gaps and conflict into our work. We have parallel efforts in the fintech space to harness the potential of e-payments and central bank digital currencies. The return from those proactive and precautionary measures will be huge. Not only do educated, healthy, connected people adapt and thrive in new industries, they can also cope better with shocks such as those due to the climate crisis. And that brings me to the importance of a resilient planet. Climate change is with us. It is already undermining food security, disrupting supply chains, jeopardizing vital infrastructure. And our research shows that done right and done now, the costs of the green transition are manageable and even more when we do it early, these costs are much lower. It is cheaper to act fast than to wait. Again, the fund is stepping up supporting policies for mitigation, adaptation, and transition, and deploying all our tools, both lending and non-lending. And I'm very grateful to those who have helped us to put in place the Resilience and Sustainability Trust. It is now operational. We have staff-level agreements for three countries, Barbados, Costa Rica, and Rwanda, with many more requests. And to the membership in the room, do not hesitate step forward, we are there for you, open for business. Uh, we, have, uh, we are on, on the way to convert the 40 billion pledges into actual funding, uh, and given the strong demand uh, already demonstrated, I'm asking those who come from strong economies, please help us to do even more. Let me conclude, since our founding, since we were founded, uh, we have always adapted to a changing world. And at every critical junction, our predecessors looked ahead and asked, do we have the right tools? Do we have the right resources for the world in which we live? This is another 
such turning point. And we must ask ourselves the same question. Finding the right answer will mean exploring all options to ensure we can be there for you, for our members, well-funded, fit for purpose. I want to thank our executive board. This is exactly what it does, work with us, so we are fit for purpose. And I want to thank the entire membership for your continued support. You have shown that as the forces of fragmentation struggle to pull us apart, the Bretton Woods institutions continue to bring us together. 190 countries cooperating on issues that matter to all of us every single day. I look forward to this support, to this solidarity, to embracing that spirit of Keynes, to build a more resilient world, and to build an IMF for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reva. At this time, I would like to call on the President of the World Bank Group, Mr. Malpas, to address the government. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Chairman Abdullah. And thank you to my dear friend and colleague, Kristalina, for your remarks. I'm very pleased to be back in person after two years of virtual and hybrid annual meetings. This week's meetings and activities have been going remarkably well with an amazing amount of energy and an abundance of good ideas. The intensity of the dedication to development and global progress is inspiring to all of us. I'm especially happy to see all of you here and throughout the course of this me week's meetings. I only wish, and I fervently wish, we were meeting under better circumstances. The crisis facing development is intensifying. Looking ahead, the Bretton Woods institutions will need to consider their roles, governance, and capital structure, and evolve to address uh, climate change and global public goods. Grants are critical for development, and an even larger IDA in the future will be important as a vital leverage source of grants and deeply concessional financing. Uh, for the financing for the poorest countries. Bigger, upwardly scaled commitments and projects, including for global public goods, are necessary as part of the World Bank Group's evolution. I will be very interested in your thoughts at the Development C Committee plenary and in the weeks ahead. It's been two years since we held this annual meetings plenary, so I wanted to provide a thorough update um, on the bank group's financial results and a few of the immense challenges we face. People in developing countries are facing severe reversals in development from the COVID-19 pandemic, including in health and education. The human consequence is catastrophic. The COVID-19 pandemic, which alone led to over six million deaths, Geopolitical conflicts and extreme weather events have each hurt countries and people worldwide, with the poor bearing the brunt, especially women and girls. Tightening of financial conditions globally, slow growth and currency depreciations are undermining fiscal space available to support education, health, climate action, and infrastructure. Over 60% of low-income countries are in debt distress or high risk of it. Many middle-income countries are facing increased liquidity pressures. 
debt service payments are rising. In 2022 alone, IDA countries will pay over $44 billion to their bilateral and private sector creditors. Um, this, is, oh, this overwhelms the bank and fund support to them this calendar year. Improving international mechanisms to resolve unsustainable debt is an imperative. One of the most prominent reversals is in education. That was the subject of our Development Committee dinner last night. It's been caused by prolonged school closures during the pandemic and worsened by that. Our data shows that 70% of children in low- and middle-income countries are in learning poverty, which is the share of children who are unable to read or understand a basic text by age 10. COVID-19 worsened the global learning crisis and resulted in the worst shock to education and learning in recorded history. Working with UNICEF, UNESCO, and many partners, we have called for countries to keep schools open, match instruction to a student's level of learning, focus on foundational learning, and increase funding. The bank group has provided consecutive surges of operational support with speed, scale, and impact. First, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and now in response to high inflation, the risk in food insecurity, and the Russian war on Ukraine. I remain horrified by Russia's actions, and I call for a Russian forces to leave Ukraine. Since the war began, the bank group has mobilized $13 billion in emergency financing for Ukraine, including grants, guarantees, and linked parallel financing from the U.S., the U.K., European countries, and Japan. Around $11 billion has already been dispersed. To mobilize additional support, the bank has also established a multi-donor trust fund to help the government sustain its capacity to deliver services, conduct relief efforts, and plan and implement the country's recovery and reconstruction. Again, we fervently hope for that prospect. The bank group has provided, uh, um, I would like to take a moment to thank, the, I would like to take this moment uh, to thank our dedicated staff in over 130 locations around the world for their passion and perseverance to deliver on our mission. Let me also take this opportunity to thank our shareholders for your support, and particularly those who have already subscribed to the capital under the 2018 capital increases of IBRD and IFC. Timely payments are imperative as we look toward, uh, toward effectively leveraging our financing to respond to the overlapping challenges facing our clients. As of the end of September, IBRD had received $4.4 billion out of the $7.5 billion allocated. IFC had received $2.3 billion out of the $5.5 billion allocated. Uh, I would also like to thank governors for your generous pledges to IDA 20. Uh, the IDA 20 replenishment of $93 billion was the most ambitious in IDA history and is backed by a policy package that is fit for purpose. This record financing envelope was made possible by donor contributions from 52 high- and middle-income countries, totaling $23.5 billion, with additional financing raised in capital markets through repayments from borrowers and from the World Bank's own contributions. This underscores the exceptional value for money that IDA offers to its partners. Every $1 that donors contribute to IDA achieves almost $4 of support for the poorest countries, providing a strong, non-fragmented platform and e increased efficiency for development impact. In FY22, the bank group commitments rose to a record $115 billion. Commitments during FY22 were informed by our knowledge work and helped countries address rising food prices, manage refugee flows, bolster health preparedness, improve climate financing, maintain private sector trade, and support uh, deeper efforts to mitigate and ad adapt their economies, uh, among other a range of benefits, benefiting especially the poor and most vulnerable. 
Given higher loan demand due to rising global interest rates, there is a heightened importance for scalable, impactful country programs and funding for global public goods. IBRD's net income was $4 billion in FY22. That's compared to $2 billion in FY21. That's primarily due to the unrealized mark-to-market -market gains on IBRD's non-trading portfolios. Allocable income, the measure that IBRD uses for net income allocation decisions, was $0.8 billion, down from $1.2 billion in FY21. This was primarily due to the increase in the provision for loan losses and other exposures driven mostly by the increase in the implied forward interest rates. Fiscal discipline throughout the year helped increase allocable income and fully fund bank activities to expand commitments. The allocable income was used to augment equity and support development activities, including a transfer from IBRD to IDA of $117 million. The crisis buffer of $5 billion that was approved by our board for FY23 will allow us to continue to be responsive to the high demand from our client countries with a lending limit of $36.4 billion in FY23 and an adjustable sustainable annual lending level, or SAL, of $27 billion. In addition to compliance with the policy minimum E to L ratio, SAL estimates are also consistent with IBRD's statutory lending limit per IBRD's Articles of Agreement. Our crisis response capacity beyond FY23 can be further strengthened with increased bilateral guarantees from highly rated donors, more funding through grants from the international community, and timely subscriptions, as I mentioned, to the 2018 capital increase that those would further strengthen IBRD's ability to increase commitments consistent with financial sustainability. Turning to IDA, IDA's gross disbursements of $21 billion in FY22 were higher than the average of the past uh, five years and pre-COVID levels. IDA's net income was $12 million compared to a net loss of $433 million in FY21. The increase in net income uh, was primarily driven by currency translation adjustment gains due to the strengthening of the U.S. dollar. Adjusted net income, the measure that IDA uses to monitor the economic results of its operations, was $0.3 billion. That's $0.1 billion lower than the prior year. This lower outturn for FY22 is in the context of a significant one-time increase in interest revenue in FY21 when Sudan was able to clear its arrears. Importantly, in FY21, we implemented the Sustainable Development Finance Policy, SDFP, under IDA to promote debt transparency and sustainability. IFC had a net loss of $464 million for FY22, primarily driven by lower Treasury income as a result of sharply rising yields for U.S. Treasuries. It's worth noting that IFC's net income of $4.2 billion in the prior year had a substantial component of unrealized gains on investments of $3.3 billion when the markets rebounded post the immediate effect of COVID-19. And lastly, MEGA had net income of $28 million in FY22 compared to $82 million in FY21. The decrease reflects the combined effect of higher reserves for claims and investment loss versus investment income in FY21 and lower operating income with budgeted increases in staff costs and decrease in net premium income. The bank group also channeled additional funding to development through its borrowing program with continued backing from the capital markets. I should say strong backing, and we welcome that. IBRD, IDA, and IFC raised medium and long-term debt of $41 billion, $10 billion, and $9 billion, respectively, during FY22. IDA continued to extend its benchmark curve and issued, this is notable, a 20-year euro-denominated 2 billion uh, euro bond 
with a 70 basis point coupon in January of 22. That was the longest maturity bond in any currency. IDA also recently priced a 15 year Euro, uh, Euro 2, 2 billion Euro bond with a 250 basis point coupon in August of 2022, continuing to channel private capital to IDA. Since the start of the pandemic, these large and successful borrowings have enabled the bank group uh, to commit $270 billion. That's an unprecedented level of financial support to public and private sector clients to fight the impacts of the pandemic. The financing helped address the health emergency, strengthened health systems, expanded support for social safety nets, supported businesses, created jobs, and financed the purchase and distribution of COVID-19 vaccines. To increase preparedness, the bank has established a new financial intermediary fund, the fifth for pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response. It's the PPR fifth. The fund will provide a dedicated stream of additional long-term financing to strengthen pandemic preparedness and response capabilities in low and middle income countries and address critical gaps through investments and technical support at the national, regional, and global levels. Thank you to everyone who worked on that important new fund. In response to the current set of crises, we are planning to provide $170 billion in commitments over the 15-month period from April 2022 through June 2023, a massive uh, commitment and, and expansion of World Bank efforts. Of this, $30 billion is aimed at the food crisis to address food insecurity, encourage food and fertilizer production, enhance food systems, facilitate greater trade, and support vulnerable households and producers. The IFC has launched a separate $6 billion facility to strengthen the private sector's ability to respond to the crisis and support food production. Uh, at the outset of the food crisis, together with the with WFP, IMF, WTO, and FAO, we called, Kristalina and I, with our partners, called for urgent and coordinated action to increase global production and help vulnerable countries on food security. Uh, since then, there has been considerable progress in four key areas. First, providing immediate support to the vulnerable, Two, facilitating trade in the international supply of food. Three, boosting production. And four, investing in climate resilient agriculture. We still call on the need for increasing production further, reducing excess storage, avoiding export and import barriers, and investing in food systems uh, and their transformation. The $639 billion of distortive agricultural subsidies globally should be repurposed to transform food systems and improve food security and nutrition. We are also working uh, with, through the Global Alliance for Food Security with the German G7 presidency to identify gaps, map them through a dashboard, and provide timely and quality information on food nutrition and funding variables. In response to the impacts of the war in Ukraine, countries are shifting their energy policies in ways that may slow down the energy transition and affect the achievement of energy access and global climate goals. High, that's one of the, the big, uh, big impacts, negative impacts of the war in Ukraine. Higher energy prices for consumers and industry are reducing economic growth and have caused a retreat to higher emissions energy sources. The global food, energy, and fertilizer crisis is taking a toll on developing countries. These sectors are closely interlinked. Natural gas is used both as a feedstock and energy source in the production of ammonia, accounting for 70 to 80 percent of ammonia production costs. The rapid increase in natural gas prices has turned into an increase in fertilizer prices, with fertilizer prices tripling over the past two years. Tight natural gas supplies and high prices have caused many producers of urea and ammonia to stop operations, which may reduce fertilizer application rates for the next crop season, 
prolonging and deepening the impact of the food crisis. At the same time, the climate crisis continues to be relentless, impacting agricultural pro productivity, migration, and livelihoods. Over my three and a half years as president, the World Bank Group's commitments with climate co-benefits have steadily and massively increased, reaching around $32 billion in FY22. The Bank Group remains the biggest multilateral funder of climate investments in developing countries. We intend to, we are going much further by providing solutions to pool funding from the global community for impactful and scalable projects that reduce greenhouse gas emissions, improve resilience, and enable the private sector. In this context, we are proposing SCALE, a new umbrella trust fund for the bank's results-based climate activities. SCALE will provide grants for verifiable emissions reductions and aim to expand the funding sources for these activities. Massive funding sources are needed, including from the private sector and philanthropic sources. This initiative is an important non-debt source of funding to incentivize climate action and support increased ambition in countries' nationally determined contributions. As part of our Climate Change Action Plan, which focuses on integrating climate and development, we have begun publishing our CCDRs, cl Country Climate and Development Reports. These new core diagnostic reports help countries prioritize the most impactful actions that can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and boost adaptation. Reports on Turkey, Vietnam, G5 Sahel, Nepal, Rwanda, and China have already been published, with close to 20 more nearing completion and expected to be published in coming months. We are also leading the effort on methane emission reductions with impactful projects and initiatives. Given the short-term potency of methane, Cost-effective interventions are a priority. We have a long record of engagement in this area and are deepening our engagement for a fast mitigation sprint. We will engage with clients more systematically on this front, on methane, including with CCDRs, providing more analytical and financial support, and leading engagements with partners, including with other development finance institutions and with the private sector. Addressing increasingly complex development challenges requires the World Bank Group to maintain core values and foster a strong workplace culture. Reversals in development will require an even greater focus on deploying capital efficiently and operating robust institutions. Internally, the World Bank completed a realignment that brings management accountability and staff closer to clients and country programs with the goal of applying global knowledge for our client countries and achieving good development outcomes that will be scalable, particularly in fragile and conflict-affected situations. We have implemented recommendations to address sexual harassment, racial discrimination, and retaliation. I am personally committed to make the World Bank Group more accountable and inclusive. I am confident that sustainable solutions will emerge for the world, helped by our hard work and in part by embracing constructive change through innovation, new uses for existing assets, workers using their skills in new ways, and a reset on excessive debt burdens. We will continue to work toward broad-based growth that reduces poverty and lifts all countries and all people with improvements in global public goods. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Malpas. Let us now turn to the formal business of the institutions. We have before us the reports and recommendations of the Joint Procedures Committee. Report one covers business of the fund. Report two covers business of the bank, IFC, and IDA. 
and Report 3 concerns matter of common interest to all organizations. We also have the report of the Procedures Committee of the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency. On the recommendations of the Joint Procedures Committee and the Mega Procedures Committees, I propose the adoption of these reports and the recommendations contained therein. As there is no objection, the reports and recommendations are adopted. On matters related to the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, I ask Mr. Malpas, as Chairman of Exceed Administrative Council, to take the floor, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm honored to open this 56th annual meeting of the ICSID Administrative Council. I want to start by congratulating all ICSID members on adopting ICSID's new rules and regulations this past year. I also welcome our new members, Ecuador, Kyrgyz Republic, and Angola. The three items on the ICSID agenda this year call for the adoption of resolutions by the Council to first approve the 2022 ICSID annual report, second, to adopt the administrative budget for fiscal year 2023, and third, to re-elect the two deputy secretaries general. The draft resolutions have been distributed to members earlier. I propose that the draft resolutions on the ICSID 2022 annual report, the ICSID administrative budget for fiscal year 2023, and the re-election of two Deputy Secretaries General be adopted. Without objection, the resolutions are adopted. I hereby adjourn the 2022 annual meeting of ICSID's uh, Administrative Council. Thank you, Mr. Malpas. I thank the governors of the Fund and the Bank for the honor to have served as chair of this joint session, and I thank you for your support and cooperation. Allow me also to express my deep appreciation to Ms. Georgieva and Mr. Malpas for their leadership of our two institutions. I also appreciate the commitment of the staff of the fund and the bank for carrying out the vital work of these institutions. I would also like to thank Mr. Ogada and Mr. Mbon, as well as the staff of the Secretariat of both institutions for the successful organization of the meetings. I would also like to thank the two vice chairs, the governors of Austria and Bhutan. I wish to congr congratulate the governor of Ukraine, who has been selected to chair the coming year. I wish all governors and delegates a fruitful and productive meeting period and a safe journey home after the completion of our work. I look forward to seeing you next year again in Morocco. I hereby adjourn the meeting of the 2022 annual meetings of the Boards of Governors of the IBRD, IBRD IDA, IFC, and MEGA and IMF 